Um, welcome to the second part of the conference from the Ten to Validate project. So uh, we are going to listen to several very interesting and inspiring uh, presentations. And uh, the first one that is going to, to be held is uh, Anika Hase and Samuel Bunch. They come from the Institute of Inclusive Education from Germany. And the title of the speech is Institute for Inclusive Education. People with so-called intellectual disabilities are, are teaching at universities. So we think that we are going to listen to a very interesting conference. Please, uh, Anika, thank you very much. Vielen Dank for your attendance to this conference. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will just share my screen. Okay, I hope you can all see it now. Good afternoon. Uh, we are very excited to be a part of this event and thank you very much for having us and your interest in our session as well. We are the Institute for Inclusive Education. My name is Annika Hase, and I'm looking forward to giving you an overview about the work that we do. Afterwards, I will let you hear from my colleague Samuel Wunsch, who will give you an insight into his perspective as an educational specialist. We are a nonprofit limited company that is affiliated to the Kiel University in the north of Germany. We are funded by the Ministry of Education, Science and Cultural Affairs of the federal state of Schleswig-Holstein, which is also where Kiel is, and our shareholder is the Foundation Drachensee. Here you can see our team in Kiel, Germany. And the man on the left side of the screen is our founder, Jan Wolf Schnabel is his name. The Institute for Inclusive Education is qualifying and employing people with so-called intellectual disabilities as educational specialists. We will now look at what exactly educational specialists do for a living. We created this project so that people with so-called intellectual disabilities can give seminars and lectures at universities. The educational specialists talk about the lives and needs of people with disabilities and communicate these to the students at the universities. In our federal state, educational specialists are now a permanent part of the curricula of different universities. On the left side, there is a picture of a full lecture hall and on the right side of a seminar, and both are organized and held by our educational specialists. At the moment, they happen digitally, not in person. They talk about topics such as education, work, housing, leisure, culture, or health. And together with the students, they work out similarities and differences between their lives and reflect on experiences, potentials, opportunities, and even privileges. They also discuss wishes for a more inclusive society. But how did my colleagues become educational specialists? So in Germany, there are so-called workshops for people with disabilities, and these workshops provide employment, but this type of work does not belong to the general labor market, and therefore the salary is lower. So the founder of the project wanted to give people with intellectual disabilities who work in these workshops the opportunity to go through a qualification. And once qualified, they would become educational specialists and get employed on the general labor market earn more salary and be subject to social insurance. So in 2013, six people with intellectual disabilities started a three year full time qualification. The trainees learned in two different ways. There was theoretical input with exams and there was also learning how to use this in educational settings and even hold seminars while still in the qualification with students. The qualification is based on a manual that we created as well, and it has five different modules, and it's always centered around the strengths and competencies of the trainees in the program. So you might be wondering how this idea came about in the first place. Our motivation for this project is connected to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
The CRPD has several articles that aim to improve participation for people with disabilities, but we focused especially on three different articles. 24, education, article 27, work and employment, and then there is also article 8, awareness raising. For people with intellectual disabilities, there is little access to higher education and limited opportunities for employment on the general labor market. With the qualification, we developed a higher education that leads to secure employment and that also opens the exclusive higher education sector for people with disabilities. But also the educational specialists reach people without, without disabilities who had no previous experiences with disabilities and learn to remove these barriers in the minds in a safe environment. The students learn inclusion competencies firsthand, which will then later help them in their future professions. So the idea was to not only give people with intellectual disabilities access to an education and secure employment, but to also utilize their knowledge as experts in their own course to talk to students, teachers, professionals, administrative staff, and even politicians about what it's like to be a person with disabilities in an exclusive society. We follow the principle, not about us, without us. This means that people with disabilities know best what they need or what their lives look like. Their input is a great addition to the fields of science and theory that are mainly taught at universities. So here you can see where we have already implemented our qualifications. In Kiel and Heidelberg, where you can see the stars, we already employed educational specialists. In Cologne, Stendal, Leipzig and Dresden, the qualifications are currently running and next year the trainees will be finished. In Neubrandenburg, the qualification will start this year. And there are several other places we, where we are already in the planning of implementing qualifications, hopefully soon. Because our five-year goal is that we want to have educational specialists all over Germany, but at least 60 qualification positions at 10 universities in Germany. And then, if possible, we also want to have educational specialists worldwide. I would now like to hand over to my colleague Samuel, who will give us an insight into his personal development and life as an educational specialist. And for that, I will just stop my presentation and pass over to you, Samuel. Yes, thank you very much. Also, hello from, uh, from me. I'm also very excited to be here. And yes, my name is Samuel Wunsch, and I am employed as an educational specialist since 2016 at the Institute of Inclusive Education. I would like to start my presentation with telling you about, uh, about my disabilities. After that, I will describe to you my professional development. And finally, I will end the presentation on telling you why the qualification was, was worth it for me. But let's start with chapter one, my disabilities. I have a physical disability and my physical disability is that, that both of my wrists, ulna and radius are fused together, which means that I can't lift uh, and carry heavy objects. Then I have a learning disability. And my learning disability means that it sometimes takes longer until I have understood something correctly and can implement it accordingly. And this also results in slower reactions. Then, Third, I have a mental disability. And my mental disability consists, among other things, of a, of a mental illness and additional similarities to the Asperger syndrome and other impairments. And my severe visual impairment that I have means that I'm very short-sighted, but apart from wearing glasses, you can't notice my visual impairment. 
Let's move on to chapter two, my and my professional career. Before uh, my um, before my current job, I worked in a uh, I worked in a workshop for people with disabilities for many years. At at the beginning, it was uh, quite fun, but with time, the way the work became very um, or quite boring. And during that time. I also lacked certain skills, such uh, like um, social skills. I, I also lacked professionally development opportunities and the chance to advance professionally. But then the project Inclusive Education started and I, I, I had a new hope. During the qualification, my teammates and I learned about different topics. But we also went to the Kiel University of Applied Sciences and the University of Kiel and held lectures and seminars. And this is what we are still doing today, teaching students about the lives of people with disabilities. But from time to time, I also co-teach with other lecturers, for example, at various educational events. And the last chapter, and this is the question which I want uh, or which I want to answer now, why was it worth why was it worth it for me? Um, it was worth it because I realized that I can do more than I think. Today, I work very cognitively and can be creative. In the past, I wasn't creative at all and didn't know what to do with it because of my learning disability. But when I qualified, I discovered for myself that I can be creative despite my, by, uh, my impairment. I also have developed additional skills that I didn't think it was uh, possible. And I also experienced a personal change of perspective. But moreover, I was able to present my unique work globally on different business trips. For example, there were business trips to different international conferences, like one in Spain, where I give a presentation in English and a little Spanish at the end of 2018. Another example was the Zero Project Conference 2020 in Vienna, Austria, where I co-hosted a panel. But before the conference, I got the opportunity presenting the Institute at the Austrian Parliament. So all in all, I can say that I get to see more of the world, meet more people, have more empowerment and self-determination. I get to tell people about my work but the most important of all is to change the thinking inside the society and how people with disabilities are seen. I can help make that change because what I know and what I can do, only I know and only I can do and there's no one else in the world who can do it because I am unique. So thank you very much for your intention, attention. Thank you very, very much, Samuel, Anika. I think that uh, your testimonial is wonderful for us experience of how inclusive educations can become 
uh, real situation and how participation of people with intellectual disabilities can be also real in our society. Incredible testimonial. Thank you very much for your nice, interesting presentation. Well, after this very inspiring conference, then let's go to Stephanie Kola. Um, Stephanie Kola is uh, works in the Federal Monitoring Body for Accessibility of Information Technology in Germany, and she's going to hold uh, this speech tandem counseling for public bodies, a user experience approach. I will share the screen and then Stephanie, the floor is yours. Yeah. So thank you, Oscar, for the introduction. And I'm glad to give you today an insight towards my project of tandem counseling for easy language which is situated at the Federal Monitoring Body for Digital Accessibility at the of the Republic of Germany. This idea was born to realize um, the legal regulations for easy language by the EU Directive for Public Bodies. I wanted to do this with uh, the quality of the user experience side. Um, that means a biovalidator in digital accessibility for easy language. And um, her name is Janina Spang. Because just by peer testing and counseling, a web page might become accessible in easy language because you need more than just the text. But each idea needs a gatekeeper, as you know, and therefore my acknowledgement goes to the head of the federal monitoring body, uh, to Michael Wahl, who immediately, immediately grabbed my idea and said, yes, the user experience uh, view is so important and we need counseling and testing by peers. And um, according to this, uh, he involved also members of his staff to whom my acknowledgement also uh, goes to Alexander Finksler and Marco Zesch, who supported um, Janina and me with a huge amount of organizational and technical items. Yeah, so. Our target, as I mentioned already, is the implementation of digital accessibility according to the EU directive, um, which means that in Germany, um, the websites and uh, mobile applications have to be accessible up from, for websites, the 23rd, um, of September last year and for mobile applications up to from the 23rd of June this year. So um, there are also duties for the public bodies to um, yeah, give information on their websites um, in easy language. And um, so they are affected by easy language, fortunately. And um, what is a public body? Public bodies are administrations, minist ministries, uh, law institutions, but also health institutions, which are ruled by state, or um, just uh, um, yeah, foundations, which are financed by state up from 50%, according um, in Germany to the, uh, um, law uh, for disabled people or challenged people, I prefer this name, um, in paragraph 12a, there is the duty to um, give information in easy language immediately. And as a part of the um, BGG, there is the barrier free information technique regulation. Um, and there in the paragraphs four and seven um, is fixed easy language um, as an obligation for websites of public bodies. So 
there is a need in a qualification process and um, yeah the first things um, which are yeah obligated are the home page this means about us it's for um, yeah the information um, someone gets uh, if this is of interest him for him or not then the navigation so it's um, for the self-determined process to um, go through a web page and to select by uh, him or herself if uh, the content is of uh, interest. Then further important content. This is a very flexible definition, um, but Imagine you are a health institution, you want to give some information um, uh, about cancer, and then you have to think about what is your target group. Is your target group also the target group of uh, people with disabilities and learning disabilities? Um, are they also affected by cancer? Might that be? Yes, so you should give this important information. So you should give this further important content and the more the best. Then last but not least, that's the paragraph seven, which I mentioned um, of the BET fee is the declaration on accessibility, including a feedback mechanism. And that is nothing else but a help desk if you uh, find a barrier, if you find as a challenged person um, by cognitive or learning disabilities, two complex uh, sentences, technical um, uh, um, words, then you can give a sign by the feedback mechanism. And the author of the web page is, um, yeah, has to um, improve his web page. So the declaration on accessibility is um, yeah, to, to, um, to recreate every year. Um, and um, you have to give the information in easy language. So, and that's a huge range of duties uh, for public bodies. Um, in the items of easy language and therefore we did the implementation of the tandem counseling and testing. Yeah, so we have a double expertise in easy language. That's uh, me as a facilitator, as you want to say so. I'm translator and expert in digital accessibility, especially for easy language. And the validator Janina Spang as examiner for websites and applications. And first of all, as a peer who can give us and the public bodies the useful user experience. So we counsel in two ways. First of all, we have the textual and non-textual items according to the BITV paragraph 2a. This means um, that um, we have the textual criteria in easy language, according to part two, where the rules of Netzwerk Leichte Sprache are mentioned. So um, I think uh, Bernabe Rossio mentioned this, the Netzwerk Leichte Sprache this morning. Second, um, the non-textual criteria, um, we involve and they are out of the web content accessibility guidelines. These are technical success criteria, which are um, yeah, uh, very important that um, a user can percept, can understand, and can operate. So, and um, the second is the user experience itself. Uh, it gives a holistic view towards um, the so-called usability, which is uh, written down in a normalization. Um, it's called DIN ISO. I have written it here on this slide if you want to read it. And uh, there are uh, three criteria 
which fit perfectly to the technical criteria of the VCAG. And these are efficiency. How can I do everything what I want in a quick and efficient way? Is it effective? So can I reach my target? Can I solve everything um, by uh, percepting easy language and uh, doing this on a web page, what I want to do? And is it satisfying? So, and we also include um, the, um, as Annika Hase mentioned, the Article 8 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, according to their special knowledge um, towards the, these items, um, because they are peers. So, um, what is the concrete peer challenge of digital accessibility? And in the morning, Elisa Perigo asked um, us about uh, a validation checklist. And I think, um, according to the Web Cognitive Guidelines, we have this checklist perhaps already. <laughs> and you can see it on this slide, orientation. There we are, uh, our target group is challenged by. That means what can I do? How can I use this? Am I self-determined? Perception, is content clear, understandable and not annoying? So are sentences short? Words are common in use. Performance, can I reach my target efficient, quick and satisfying? Have, uh, do I have an icon which is easy to find on the website? Yeah, I guess the easy to read icon, yeah? How is the placement, the figure, the color? Can I recognize it? That means, can I, can I have a recall? Is accent and con uh, access and content, uh, are they reliable? Am I able to remember? Am I able to do it anytime in the same way? Is it consistent? Consistence is a VCRG criteria, success criteria on itself. Then decision-making. Are applications and informations clear and without timeout, which kicks me out? Solving. Am I able to handle the website by easy applications, assistive technologies, and a level of language, yeah, our easy uh, um, uh, speech language uh, level, A1 or A2, and finalizing, do I come to an end throughout a clear and stable website structure so that the content is clear and understandable, that structure gives me perception, um, even text structure is meant by this, and therefore, is it usable? So we um, scaled easy language in, and these are our solution in three levels. We say these are the preconditions of, for perceptibility, to percept, to understand, um, yeah, uh, um, and uh, to, to see it in a holistic way, beside um, you are impaired by um, according um, disabilities. So like deaf, blind people, um, which have learning and uh, cognitive disabilities, but perhaps um, also a movement disorder. So the technical level is of importance. It gives us, as the precondition for usability. So over screen reader, joystick, on-screen keyboard. Then we have second, the representative level. level. It enables perceptibility by adapting different output variants. So like contrast, alternative text. We heard about it. Um, this morning, indication of text function, labeling of text sections, 
symbols and icons which explain its, its function, site structure, alternatives of reading level also. And you see here fit the VCIG levels, the Web Cognitive um, uh, Content Accessibility Guidelines, to the third level, which is on the next slide. This is the content level. There, this level assists comprehensibility of the text through setting reader and text in reference to one another. Um, and this by aligning the European framework of references for languages. And then for easy language, of course, uh, by level A1 or A2. And um, this content level is divided in Germany in two factors of understanding. Um, after Netzwerk Leichte Sprache, we have there the A internal factors like usage of common words, explanation of technical terms, avoidance of negotiation, and B external factors like sentence construction. Um, usage of numbers, function marks, font, and text design. So um, what throughout do we um, gain of the tandem counseling when the public bodies call Janina and me and they want to have some advices? So we already get some evidence-based data about that. We have a high request of public bodies to improve digital accessibility um, for easy language. So 80% of 100% who calls us uh, immediately uh, come into realization. Um, the motivation um, is of four types. To fulfill legal regulation, as I mentioned, that are 100% to make accessibility visual by easy language is really an item of marketing and uh, strategic communication. It's so cool for them because um, how can a user recognize that a web page is accessible? Yes, by the common easy um, uh, language uh, icon or by sign uh, language you can see on this. So it's visible, it makes accessibility, easy language makes accessibility visible. And third, there is a lack, a huge lack of knowledge about textual and non-textual items to create easy language in digital um, access really barrier free. These are 90%. And um, there we have a lot of yeah, information to give, a lot of counseling to do. Um, and the fourth point is to include the user experience because by the tandem counseling, um, the public bodies recognize that the user view, the user experience of Janina is really, really great because just if you can use it and if uh, the peer says yes it it's it works for me it's really good so which outcome by tandem counseling do we have um Yes, we do this counseling upon the three levels of standards for easy language um and we involve the challenges like perception, orientation, all of this type, so that tandem, tandem counseling gets really evidence-based. And we see, and we can counsel for, an easy access, clear structure and navigation, which supports to understand how things are and how to use them. Second, clear buttons, icons, symbols, helping user to find what they need. 
there's a lot of uh, this to say about contrast, the font and the icon itself. Yeah, do I understand uh, by it what is meant? What shall I do with it? Then third, understandable content by easy language level A1 or A2. The feedback mechanism and time out to avoid mistakes and to help to correct them so that I can go through a page without annoying. Then um, we give the advice, advice um, of no pop-ups, music, banners, um, and no time out. But for a calm background, this is so useful and important for the people um, which have a problem with orientation and concentration. Then helping that process doesn't rely on memory by gathering key points from a heavy text. Explain technical or unfamiliar words. Don't change the meaning of one word. Provide blocks or text or content which are headed and use short sentences. Support adaption and personalization by contrast. Pointer gestures that you can uh, magnify it, text alternatives, videos, pictures, reading level or voiceover and provide um, help and support by feedback mechanism, autofill in, plug-ins in easy language, um, which you give an orientation and help what to do next. So, our findings in tandem counseling are that we could improve the appre appreciation for quality and importance of the user experience. Um, we could do an improvement of quality for digital access by providing success, success criteria throughout perceptible, operable, understandable and robust items, as I mentioned, for, uh, um, according to the Web Cognitive Accessibility Guidelines. We uh, recognize that there is a wide range of websites providing easy language from German government bodies, which are quite clear in content, stable and accessible to public federal state bodies. There is a diverse landscape, let me mention like, uh, like this. And um, our tandem counseling supports empathy and duty to fulfill the EU regulation up from the 23rd of September last year from websites and up from the 23rd in June of, uh, at, of this year for mobile apps. So in, uh, yeah, in the end, we have an acknowledgement of guidelines for easy language in digital access. And this is quite a good result, I think. And um, there I brought you um, for the end, <laughs> uh, an example of our practical approach because um, Michael Wahl wanted to um, yeah, create an easy symbol, uh, easy icon um, to, um, yeah, uh, to, to uh, uh, sign the barrier for the fee feedback mechanism. Um, so that you um, can re do a report on a barrier. And these are the both um, icons which um, uh, is, uh, someone created, a designer, and Janina um, and me, we proved them to digital accessibility. And Janina's choice was the first one you see on the slide. Um, with a white font because she said the white font is better to read and the red letter is better to recognize as um, uh, uh, um, the symbol to report a barrier. So nowadays you can find it on the homepage of the www.bfit-bund.de and you are invited to visit us and um, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I hope I could give you some good information and just in time. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Stephanie. That was a very interesting speech. And I think that there are many information about how is the work with facilitators and validators in a practical way. Um, so you have shown a very clear example of how it is done. So uh, let's then uh, give uh, some uh, a, a pair of minutes for questions from the audience to Stephanie Kola, Anika Haze, and Samuel Bunch. Any questions for these speaking this speech? No I think there is the po po okay. Sorry. No, 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 Stephanie, please. Yeah, I think there's a possibility uh, to give me an email. If there are any questions, it's no problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Stephanie. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. It was a great pleasure. Uh, it was a, a great pleasure uh, you. for your uh, for your conference. And now, let's go to Sweden. And our, our next guests are Stefan Johansson and Karin Eklund Malros from Begripsam in Sweden. Uh, they together are going to hold uh, both uh, speeches. Stefan Johansson, titled The Understandable Text Project and Methods for Evaluating Readability and Understandability. And uh, Karin Eklund Malmros is going to hold the speech, a mainstream approach to more accessible subtitles. Thank you very much. And then now, floor is yours, please. Thank you. I will share the um, PowerPoint. Karin, Thank you. please. You have to go to uh, interpreting and then uh, choose okay. English and unmute original, uh, original audio. Down below. Yeah, below. sorry, sorry. I'm I'm Find gonna the interpreting. Yeah, English. And then English and unmute original audio. Now where do I mute the original audio? Yes, we are Is... listening to uh, we can hear you. So okay. you can you can hear us. You can share your uh, screen, please. Okay. Uh, so hello, I will take the first part, Stefan Johansson. Uh, I'm a PhD in human-computer interaction, working at uh, Begripsam together with Karin. Uh, and we will do a joint presentation. We have two projects to, to present for you, and, and thank you for having us today. Stefan, uh, sorry. I... Uh, you have to go to interpreting down in Zoom, choose English, and then unmute original audio. Where do I unmute? Perfectly, we can hear you. Okay. Please. Yeah, okay. Hello, everybody, and thanks for, for having us. Uh, and we will do this presentation in two steps. So I will take the first one, uh, and, and Karin will manage the presentation. So I will ask her to change slides, and, and you can do that now, Karin. Uh, so, so we are uh, Stefan and Karin. I'm the CEO of of Begripsam and I also researcher in human computer interaction and work a lot with uh, cognitive accessibility and, and Karin is one of our project managers at, at Begripsam currently working a lot with subtitling and, and accessible uh, video content. Uh, yeah, next slide Karin. And, and only to just a short thing about us in Begripsam we work as uh, we have sort of three different uh, legs, you can say, and we, we are a consultancy organization. We are working with activism to change society in, in a more accessible direction. And we also do research. So we have currently, we are funding two PhD students and, and we are engaged in different research projects. Yeah, next slide. Uh, so the first part of the presentation is about the understandable tech, text project and, and, and methods that we have worked with in that project to, to sort of dig deeper into uh, readability and understandability and, and how people who themselves experience uh, reading impairments find 
uh, what they find the most important things to think about when, when producing texts. Uh, and, and the second phase will, will be about uh, accessible subtitling. Yeah. And, and we actually, we have the same challenges in both cases, I think. Uh, it's about simplification without losing information. So you have, you have a lot of information that, that is supposed to be presented in, in a sort of an easy and understandable way, but you don't want to lose any information along, along the way. Uh, so often the problem of also is that something that is is very long and complicated uh, should be presented short, still without losing information. Uh, and and, you, and if you move into the video area, you also have a limited time frame. And in both cases, you have might have a text that has sort of a limited space, uh, or people have limited time and space to to comprehend uh, co content. So what we're struggling with is, is this dilemma, and I think you have touched upon that many times this, this day. Is it, is it possible to do a, a version that, that sort of works for everybody, or should we, should we go for different versions and adapt, uh, adapt uh, text and or, or content for different needs? So basically a sort of a tension between a universal design approach or, or sort of a separate version approach. Uh, yeah, next slide, Conan. And next, this is about the, the Understandable Text project. And, and in that project, we worked uh, a core group of 15 participants with different kinds of, of reading impairments. Uh, and, and, and then 100 of persons with reading impairments was engaged at some times during this three-year project. And then we did a survey with, uh, with over 500 uh, participants with reading impairments. Uh, and, and, and sort of the starting point for all this was, was that many of them found the public information or, or news media texts too difficult. Uh, we have worked in Sweden with sort of easy to read and, 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 and easy language projects for many time. And, and, and actually the government agencies are obliged to present their information in, in an understandable way. We have a special law on that. Nevertheless, people find the information really difficult to understand. Uh, so so, so this one starting point we had that the producers of the information, they might believe that they are producing text uh, of good quality and, and easy to understand and, and, and comprehend. Uh, but, but our analysis was that they are actually the problem. They are producing texts that people don't understand. So we think working together, joining experts, people with the reading impairments and the producers uh, sound like a good idea. And that, that's sort of what we have done in the project. So next slide. Uh, and we have, we have just a lot of different methods and, and we started by reading with eye tracker technology just to sensitize ourselves of how, how actually how different people read. And, and we could see clearly uh, when we analyzed that material that, that people with reading impairments read different than, than people who don't experience that kind of, of uh, difficulties. We did a lot of interviews and group discussions and we started to co-create and co-design accessible texts and, and, and as a parallel process, we started to produce requirement. What was actually the thing that those people with reading impairments found the most sort of useful solutions for creating accessible text. Uh, and then we tested this and, and, and also developed methods to work together with text producers and uh, make them sort of more aware of what, when did they cause trouble and what was that in their sort of producing of text that caused troubles. And, and at that point, we also realized that we have to work together also with designers because the, it's a mixed responsibility of the producer and the designer of the content. Sort of that those things are interrelated when it comes to how, how understandable the, the result will be. Uh, and then we ended the project with some, some nice videos and we have links to those, they, they have subtitles in, in English and Italian, if you want to, to, to 
listen and, and watch the videos afterwards. Yeah, next slide. And we identified 19 requirements and, and you can see them, see them in this slide. It, it's, uh, I, I think the, you can get the presentation after if you want to dig deeper in the data, but we identified 19 uh, sort of important requirements so that was derived from what the people with reading difficulties said. Uh, and then we ranked them in, in different kind of voting systems. So, so we sort of could, could see that the most important thing from, from this group of people was that there is a header on the text describing the content. That, and, uh, and if possible, information should be, should be sorted by bullet lists and the text should be short. And, and many of those are, are sort of known from, from other research, I think. Uh, some are not that often described in, in literature, perhaps, but, but these were the most, most important uh, by the 19, uh, 19 most important requirements that we identified. Uh, and then we could divide it to see if there is there sort of a consensus. Do, does the kind of reading impairment or reading difficulty uh, make a difference how people rank uh, and, and sort of prioritized by, by those requirements. So we can take next slide, Karin. Uh, these are the results from, from a survey of, 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 I think it was 500 particip participants. And, uh, and here you can see the result sorted after diagnosis. And then you can see that, that, that there is sort of, sort of consensus about in many groups, but they, they sort of prioritize quite or a bit different, I would say. Uh, so, so for example, we have two groups that, that they place the text-to-speech function as the most important. That, that was people with dys dyslexia and, and intellectual disability. Uh, so, so for them, headers were important, but not the most important. They, they rather prefer to listen to, to text than, than read it. So they ranked the text-to-speech function higher. Uh, and, and you can dig deeper into this data as well if you want to compare uh, different groups with each other. So this was a sort, a sorting according to diagnosis. And next slide, uh, Karin, is there, so that the same data sorted after the impairment that participants had said they have. Uh, and, you, and you can also here see that, 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 for example, people with memory difficulties, they also wanted the text-to-speech function on, on, for the information. So they also wanted to listen. Uh, but overall, we can see that there is sort of a consensus what is, what is important. And, and our sort of conclusion here that is that, that uh, if you follow this kind of guidelines or other heuristic guidelines as a text producer, then the result will be a more readable and, and understandable text. But also that uh, it's important to do that together with the people having the reading problems because we, uh, we asked text producers to to come to us and have workshops and, and to bring the best examples they, that they could bring from their own sort of, uh, from their own field. So, so a text that they sort of perceived being very, very readable and understandable. Uh, and, and then we did a workshop with people with reading impairments, criticizing that text. Uh, and the result always was that they, they went from the workshop with a complete different version of their text. Uh, so we did rewriting during the workshop and, and we did also a voting. Uh, so, so we had, uh, we did evaluate the, both the text in the beginning and the text in the end uh, with red, uh, yellow and green cards uh, and compared it to the requirements identified. So, so there, was, there could be a lot of red in the beginning of the workshop and then they ended with a more green uh, or yellow text in, in the end. So, so despite that they thought that they had made a lot of effort to make the, the text really, really good, uh, the, the people with reading problems could always identify possible sort of improvements. Uh, yeah, you can change slide there. Uh, and my last slide is, these are the, are the links. We, we, did, uh, we did a lot of uh, sort of uh, informative and, and also fun videos about reading reading difficulty. So, so the idea is that one person with a reading difficulty meets a producer of text and rearrange, rearrange the text live on, on, uh, sort of on, the, on the screen. 
and then you can listen to what the reflections from both parties on, on, on that discussion. Uh, and, and, and those have been really used in, in a lot of, lot of contexts in Sweden after the project. So they are sort of having a life on their own after the project has ended. Yeah, uh, I think that was my part of the presentation. Okay, then we move on to accessible subtitles. And this initiative build on what Stefan just has talked about and the Understandable Text project. And uh, we are experimenting with a mainstream approach to more accessible subtitles. So the starting point is uh, a number of questions and this is just the beginning of this work. Uh, so can we find a format that is generally accepted by the vast majority and those who struggle? And is it possible to concentrate the language into shorter subtitles displayed for a longer time? And is it possible to edit the language without losing the essence? Uh, because this is really a struggle in terms of um, making the subtitles both shorter and displayed longer. Um, and this is not uh, easy to read, just to separate from that. So a quick glance at the, the format um, as we see it now. And it's um, 32 characters um, per line. And there are two reasons for it. Uh, one reason is that W3C recommends 32 characters per line uh, for accessible subtitles. And the second reason is that uh, Facebook has um, a limit of 32 characters. So if you ex exceed that, uh, there will automatically be a, an, an, another line. Um, and then we have 10 characters per second or max 12. And the reason for that is that it's uh, civic significantly slower and it's an easy number to remember. So that's why it's, it's 10. Um, so I will present this um, format a bit now and it will be very brief, uh, but there will be additional material for those interested to look into afterwards. So this is a picture, um, just it's an example from a subtitling editor. Uh, you don't need to read everything on the screen. Uh, what I want to show with this picture is the, uh, you see the time axis and uh, the subtitles are like sausages on the timeline. And as you can see, they are sort of um, next to each other. Uh, and that's a consequence of making these subtitles shorter, but still longer in time. Um, so what I do is that I let the, the subtitle continue after the speech has ended. And if that's not enough time, then I start it before the speech begun. But also trying to take into consideration the logical time in the video. So for example, um, the change of um, slides, I don't let the talk from one slide continue on, the, on a second slide in a presentation like this. So uh, text editing dilemmas. So it's about staying true to what is said and the essence of it. Uh, so breaking lines at logical points, um, and this can be a challenge. Uh, so it's not always consistent, um, but there's a high demand on lines that are broken in, in between two blocks. So two lines and then the next two lines. Those need to be very uh, logical. Um, one sentence per block or line. Exception is one per two blocks. Um, use the same words. Uh, so only change words in exception. That's an exception. And that is if there's room for, I need the space to make it short. And some words are very long. Uh, so then you need to short, maybe change it to a shorter word to sort of to get it to fit in. Uh, 
uh, and follow the word order. And this can be a challenge because if you speak in an um, inverted word order, that is that you use the verb and then the subject, then the sentence is often very long. And then it's much more difficult to shorten the sentence. Whereas if you speak in a normal word order, subject and then verb, it's much easier to make it short. Um, but so the aim is to not change too much, uh, only change if, if it's really needed. Uh, and as you can see, this is not always possible. So it is a dilemma of sort of how to juggle this. So this is um, an example of what it can look like. Um, as you can see, uh, the number of um, blocks are fewer. Uh, the subtitles, the blocks are um, more narrow. There are fewer characters. And um, also, yeah, uh, but many of the words are the same, but trying to, so it's actually a, a question of sort of trying to condense the language, uh, keep it, as much as the original, but trying to condense it rather than simplifying it. And factors that facilitate more accessible subtitles is if you speak slowly uh, and if you use pauses, because that gives you the room to um, play around with the subtitles and normal word order uh, also facilitates. However, these three points are quite difficult because when we speak normally, we, we don't speak slowly. Uh, we don't use pauses naturally, many of us. And many of us do not speak in a normal word order or we tend to speak um, in unfinished long sentences. Um, So uh, if you're interested, we provide uh, two examples. So it's a short video with Helena Taubner. Uh, she presents her um, science and she is very easy to subtitle. Uh, her presentation is a textbook example. Uh, you can tell it is very well prepared. Uh, I have more or less written everything she has said. Um, so this is this is an ex extreme on one hand. And then um, I have Stefan on the other end, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is uh, which talks more like people do. Um, it, it is, um, I mean, he speaks from a presentation um, on top of his mind. Uh, and that is a more that is more of a challenge to subtitle. Uh, because it, he speaks freely, quite fast, and with an inverted word order, with long and unfinished sentences. So then you, you need to sort of work a little bit more um, with the subtitles. Um, so for those who are interested, um, there, there is some additional material here, and you can then upload it into a subtitle editor. Uh, you have the SRT file, so you can look at what it looks like and play around. And um, if you have any questions after uh, this, um, please feel free to contact me and Stefan. And remember, I'm the bad example here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so conclusions then, uh, so just to wrap this up, we, we, we have this uh, sort of uh, tension between a mainstream approach or, or adapted work versions. Uh, we have the production process that could sort of, maybe we need to change that. And, and we have the technical tools that could be, could be improved. So there is a lot of, lot of further research needed on this, uh, on this field to sort of improve on this, on this area. And, uh, and how, however, on however you are doing it, do it together with the people that have reading impairments. I and I don't have to say that to you attending here today because you know that uh, so so thank you for listening thank you very much stefan karin it was a very interesting presentation that you have done because you have the point the perspective 
of uh, the, the users. Uh, you have taken into account what users need and the opinion and the, uh, the experience, the user experience, which is very important to bring the better solutions for accessibility. That's the point in which train to validate is working uh, because we consider that it is very important the research, but always take taking into account the real user needs. And that's a common point. And I think that it's very relevant what Stefan have said about how uh, people, the participants, uh, have, uh, cho uh, have chosen the different items in which they feel more comfortable for the, for the easy text. And Karin, you have brought a very relevant discussion about subtitling because uh, sometimes it's quite hard not only to follow the, uh, the subtitles, but also um, joining the, uh, the speed from the uh, image with the, uh, with the reading speed that people with difficulties have. So very interesting both, uh, both works, both presentations. Thank you very much for attending uh, this conference and for sharing your knowledge. Um, we will uh, share your presentation after you, after you have said, but if you want to do it now with the links of the video, you can share it the, directly in the chat so that our audience can check now uh, the, this, uh, these videos that you have shared with, uh, with us uh, in order to, to see how you have managed the subtitles. Thank you. And now, Let's go to our last uh, conference. We are near the end and uh, we have the pleasure to introduce Gabriele Saubere from the ECQA, uh, one of our members, one of our partners, which is uh, heading the certification of the process that we are developing in the Trend to Validate project and Patricia Hortal. Uh, from Plan Inclusion Madrid, which is going to lead the next package, the next working package in which we are uh, deepen to obtain uh, the, the next result that we are going to present, hopefully this time face-to-face -face in Madrid uh, in, uh, in fall, I mean around October. So, uh, Patricia and Gabriele. Gabriele, firstly, the floor is yours and then Thank you so much, uh, thank Oscar. You. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. And I will not use the presenter mode because usually it makes troubles. <laughs> or do you do you want me to do? I can do it. Let me check. Uh, Yes, let's try. My title is European Certificates for Easy to Read Professionals, because this is going to be the exciting outcome of our project, the, easy, the certificate for uh, easy to read validators and facilitators. Uh, and you know, uh, certification, it's kind of a C word. We must be very careful with uh, certification. Uh, it causes uh, a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, and since I am a quality auditor for ages, uh, lead auditor for Austrian Standards International for ages, um, I'm, I'm really sensitive about uh, making myself uh, clear, understandable to what uh, certification means. It's not a certificate of attendance, for instance, where you just get a confirmation that you attended the conference. We are going to receive a certificate of attendance, I guess, for this very conference. But certification in our, um, uh, in our community, I would say, of the ECQ, European Certification and Qualification Association is that proper definition of all standards institutes all over the world, a third party attestation related to products, processes, systems, or persons. And I highlighted persons because this is what we are going to develop together. 
a person certificate. And an attestation means that a statement uh, is issued based on a decision following review that fulfillment of specified requirements has been demonstrated. Not, not a good word order, not, not a good uh, line for subtitling or for um, uh, easy to read <laughs> language uh, in use. Uh, this is the harmonized or the standardized certification, meaning that for a certificate, you need requirements. Uh, for an ISO standard, uh, you need uh, the consensus of all the more than 120 uh, uh, ISO members. They all use the same requirements, all the same specified requirements in that very standard. And, and that is true for ECQA and this project. We are going to develop the specified requirements of the skills and competences of an easy to read uh, validator and facilitator. Uh, why this third party is important? Uh, because it's not the only um, uh, certificate we can have or the only uh, statement. Uh, of course, yourself, you can do a self declaration. If, if you are an, an expert in easy to read language, you are allowed to call yourself, of course, uh, 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 an, an expert in uh, easy to read. Uh, so that is self-declaration. Self you are the first party or a service provider rendering easy to read uh, language services can call him or herself uh, uh, an, an expert in that. Yeah. You can be called by your client yeah, an expert, or you can be even audited by your client, then it's a second party. Uh, and it's not independent because this is your client. Many audits of clients are way more challenging than my uh, uh, audits I'm doing. Uh, why? Uh, because a client can be very picky, more picky and more sophisticated than any ISO standard or any ECQA standard. ECQA is a third party certifying uh, body, meaning this is independent. I am not your client. I am not your service provider. I am not your, uh, your trainer, your training body. ECQA is an independent third party body rendering certification. What does that mean for easy to read professionals? First of all, as I said, uh, in our project and what we are going to uh, develop for your community is an independent third party certificate. So you do not need to be a member of ECQA, you even cannot be, <laughs> or oh, you can be, but, <laughs> but this will not mean uh, that you have any, uh, that you have advantages. Yeah? Uh, uh, the, and this issues person certificates, yeah? um, ECQA is going to issue uh, these certificates for experts, these two ones, and it's not a certified E2R validator or facil facilitator, it always comes with ECQA certified, yeah? um, easy to read validator and facilitator. Why? Because the certificate is always issued by one um, uh, certification body. Yeah? This is our ECQA certification scheme we are going to produce in our project. It's not ISO certified or EU certified. Yeah? It is ECQA certified. This is also quite important to understand that this it's make uh, it, that it makes a difference. For instance, in some uh, countries, professions are highly protected. You know, uh, in Austria, when you call yourself a psychologist, who? This is really very, very restricted. Or a business consultant, 
Yeah? It's restricted. There are limitations and you need to have national accreditations and whatnot. In Germany, you do not need nothing, anything to do consultancy for companies or organizations. So that's very uh, different in, in uh, even in EU member states. So uh, we are going to produce this ECQA certified, easy to read validator certificate. And what such a European uh, certificate uh, means uh, for, for uh, our profession, it's uh, actually a revolution. It's, it's wonderful because for the first time, uh, also people with disabilities uh, with that European certificate are considered as experts. Yeah? They are certified by an independent third party certifying uh, body. They can be hired for uh, assessments and consultancy services. And for the first time, there is a European certificate not issued by uh, an association or by one organization, but by, you know, a consortium, a committee, a job role committee we are going to establish during the course of that project. And uh, all these experts are considered as competent, qualified, and at European level. So the, the, the main point here, and my heart is singing, uh, it, it, there is no more deficit, deficit thinking, yeah? but appreciation for highly qualified jobs, yeah? for recognized professionals with or without uh, disabilities in the field of accessibility. And this is not the only certificate. There is a growing uh, number of ECQA certificates for accessibility uh, professionals. Um, we have all these great uh, projects where you, uh, from ECQA certified digital accessibility educator to ECQA certified intralingual real-time subtitler to a future ECK certified trainer in inclusive distance learning. Uh, and uh, uh, last but not least, ECK certified accessibility managers. So I think this is really good news. And I'm quite uh, happy uh, to be able to share this good news with you. Thank you very much. And now, Patricia, it's your turn. Thank you, Gabriele. Now, Patricia, please. Hi. Everybody, um, as Oscar told, my name is Patricia Artal from Spain, and I'm a project manager for training programs in Plena Inclusion Madrid. Plena Inclusion Madrid will lead this uh, next stage. Oscar Garcia, Elena González, and I are taking part in it, and I'm going to share with you on what we will be working during the next months in Train to Validate project. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, Patricia, we are watching your screen. Okay. But it is not moving. Okay. Yeah, I have this problem all the time. I don't know why. Give me a minute, please. I cannot. Do it. <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm so don't worry, sorry. Patricia. We have time. Don't worry. It's fine. That's okay. why I was hesitating to yeah. use the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it happened to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I ask you if you have any questions for Gabriel. I will take my time to uh, look for the screen. Okay. Okay. Then. Thank you. Okay. Then just as uh, Patricia said, if somebody has uh, any question, I have a, a, actually one question for our uh, guests from Sweden, Stefan and Karin. Florina Gabriela von Katragen asked, uh, have you made research and discovered some main points in concepting messages for people who do not know to read, people with intellectual disabilities? No, Karin or Stefan. Could you repeat the question, Oscar? Yes. 
have you made research and discovered some main points in concepting messages for people who, uh, who do not know to read, people with intellectual disabilities? I mean, I suppose that it's going, Florina Gabriela, it's going about uh, if, if you have discovered some, um, if you have made, made some discoveries about uh, how joining messages with people who uh, have no uh, reading skills, yeah. how yeah. to uh, solve this communication problem. Yeah, we are working in another project at the moment uh, with, with people with uh, moderate intellectual disability, and some of them can read a bit and some can't read uh, at all. Uh, and, and, and they can't write either. So, so the, the, and we are working with input uh, strategies because they, uh, many of them like to search for video content on YouTube, for example. And they struggle a lot when they have to enter the search entries by text. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we have started to use uh, speech recognition. So, so, we, so they can talk the search entry into the search box at, uh, at YouTube. And, and, and we have realized that uh, a per persons who recently, they, they sort of did the same search all over again. One, one guy always looked for videos on penguins. Uh, okay. it, it's happened to be that that was the only word he could spell. Actually, he was interested in a lot of different animals. Uh, so now we can say penguin, elephant, giraffe, and, yes. and, then, and then he has expanded the, the sort of the whole universe of, of content that he can sort of access by talking to the technology rather than writing to technology. So that's, I, I think that's a really beautiful example of how different mm -hmm. modalities can be used. So, so he can sort of work on his strongest sort of field and, and not having to, to use his weakest one. So, so that's a nice example of how you can combine technology to, to sort of overcome difficulties or barriers because he hasn't he hasn't any barrier when he can talk to technology okay okay wonderful thank you very much for your answer Stefan okay and down let's turn back to Patricia I yeah. think that you have solved your technical problems <laughs> that happens <laughs> it's no problem at all Patricia don't worry please your floor is yours when you want Okay, thank you, Oscar. I'm here again. I'm sorry, I will put it that way. So uh, I will explain the next steps in trying to validate project. Um, so uh, the goal of these states will be identifying and describing the skills and competences that the two professionals, facilitators and validators should have to develop their job. And to this end, we will create uh, skill cards for both kinds of professionals through several activities in which all the partners, stakeholders, and collaborators will cooperate. And how are we going to design the skill cards? Taking into account the previous work done by our colleagues from the Politecnica University of Timisoara, we will explore which skills are required for both professional profiles, mainly in two ways. Looking at similar professions related to or not related to accessibility and approaching and knowing validators and facilitators real practice. Um, there are other professions with similarities with our object of study and whether related to accessibility or not, they will give us some clues to define uh, the the, they will give us clues to define the validators and facilitators skills. For instance, if we are talking about uh, validators, we can look at editors of subtitles profiles. And in the case of facilitators, we could look at personal assistance for people with intellectual disabilities or job coach profiles. And beyond the review of these meaningful sources, we also believe in its practical side. So that's why we will ask different groups of validators over Europe to show us their work and to share their point of view with us. 
At this point, we uh, will be able to create the skills cards for facilitators and validators according to the ECQA and the advisory board and the publication of the final versions of the skills cards and the report is expected to be ready in the last months of 2021 in order to start IO3 which will uh, develop the curricula by the hand of our Italian partners. So that's all. I uh, uh, give my congratulations to all of you and I'm open to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you for sharing the next steps in which Train to Validate project is going to move and uh, now uh, we are near the closing. So Daniel, I think that we can say that this is a milestone in the history of uh, Easy to Read because we have uh, presented the results of a very large survey uh, with a lot of very interesting uh, data. And we have also shared other very, very interesting and inspiring experiences related to inclusion of people with reading difficulties or intellectual disabilities in our society, in education, and also in qualified, future qualified professions. So maybe just we have to remind some points. Uh, aren't we, Daniel? Okay. Uh, thank you, Oscar. So uh, once again, we would like to thank all participants. Uh, maybe if the panelists could uh, turn the video on so that yes. we can all see, given that it is the closing uh, session, yes. it's, a, it's a great opportunity to, to have you all uh, together. So some uh, reminders, some points which uh, we have already mentioned throughout uh, today's conference. We invite all participants to visit our website, traintovalidate.org. Uh, we do have a mailing list. If you subscribe to our list, uh, you will automatically receive all the news, all the materials we produce. Uh, you will be in, um, in contact with uh, our uh, future events, uh, the, the, the multiplier events that our, the, the project partners will organize uh, in the next two years. Also, we invite you to, uh, to stay close to the social platforms. We are uh, present on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. Do not hesitate to contact us uh, for uh, further questions, for comments, uh, and why not for future uh, cooperation opportunities. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you very much for uh, your interest most of you will be the direct beneficiaries of our uh, research results of our work. Uh, last but not least, one more detail. As uh, we mentioned in the next days, uh, we will uh, send certification, um, uh, we will send um, certificates of attendance uh, to all conference participants and of course uh, to the speakers. If there are any other uh, comments or any other questions uh, from the participants, uh, we would uh, welcome them uh, very much in uh, this last uh, closing uh, session. I think that all reminders are clear about certificates, network, social networks. We have also included in the chat the evaluation form. Please, all participants are invited to fill in, uh, explaining or saying the opinion about the full event. And of course, comments are always welcome. And also, of course, the certificate that Daniel mentioned. So I think that uh, we are closing the, the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the attendance for all. And thank you for the organization by the tech. Uh, Polytechnic University of Timisoara, Daniel, and of course, our interpreters, uh, Simona, Ana Maria, and Marcella. Very well done. Thank you very much. It was a huge job, I know. You have, uh, you, you need the rest surely after this event, but the, the work was wonderful. Many thanks. And okay, 
I hope that we all we can all meet in Madrid in October for our next event, this time face to face. And speaking about the results of the skills cards of four, four validators and facilitators. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.